the technology required to achieve real-time ray tracing in games is clearly some high-end, magic-level stuff, but it comes at a cost. Even the top-end cards of the first RTX generation found their FPS cut in half just by turning RT on. So, putting out a more accessible, lower-performance version that doesn't really show the tech in its best light wouldn't have been a great move by Nvidia. Like, if Oculus had launched their original VR headset alongside a budget option that was just a Viewmaster and a Nintendo Power Glove. Well, in today's video, I'm strapping on that Viewmaster, buckling up my Power Glove, and trying to make it play Half-Life Alex. Look, it's a metaphor, alright? Like, this is the budget RTX card? I'm trying to make it play tougher games? Oh, shut up. Nvidia's first generation of RTX graphics cards talked a big game about real-time ray tracing, and many people would argue that, short of the top-end RTX 2080 Ti, they didn't really live up to the hype. Further down the product stack, while offering excellent conventional rendering performance and even promising some future-proofing tech in the form of deep learning super sampling, the entry-level RTX 2060 was not up to the task of performing the RT party trick without making serious compromises elsewhere. Having your frame rate cut in half is fine when you're pushing 120 FPS at 1440 high, but when your card is struggling to reach 1080 at 60 FPS in the first place, RT can seem like a step too far. Given that I know all this about the RTX 2060 without ever having tested it myself, you'd think I was pretty dumb to try out ray tracing on a low TDP mobile variant of the 2060 using some of the most RT heavy titles from the last few years. Yeah, pretty dumb. The RTX 2060 can, in general, be relied on for acceptably smooth gameplay in most modern games, so for my first pass I'll be testing four of my five titles at 1080 high with RTX disabled. After that I'll start adding RT effects. This is most likely going to result in frame rates dropping well below what most people would consider acceptable, so finally I'll do what I can to restore that lost frame rate by using DLSS. Cyberpunk 2077 is probably as close as ray tracing has to a killer app so far. While many early RTX enabled games were underwhelming in their application of ray tracing features, Cyberpunk ticks most of the boxes. Reflections and shadows are present, and so is global illumination, which in my opinion is a rather underappreciated aspect of RT. Even without these, coaxing 60fps out of the 2060 Max-Q requires a resolution of 1080 at medium settings. Enabling RT slashes the FPS by more than half, averaging less than a cinematic 24 FPS. Dropping quality settings doesn't relieve things at all, the only improvement comes with RT's partner in crime, deep learning super sampling. Even then, DLSS performance doesn't quite give back all of the frames stolen by RT, and looks pretty terrible. Four A games seem pretty enthusiastic about the possibilities of RT, so much so in fact they released a revamped RT exclusive version of Metro Exodus, with full ray traced reflections, shadows, ambient occlusion and GI. From my perspective this makes comparing RT off and on pretty difficult, as it will mean having both the enhanced edition and regular edition installed simultaneously, and British internet speeds make that a pretty unappealing option. I decided instead to stick with the Enhanced Edition and see how the GPU handles it. At 1080 Ultra, with RT at its lowest setting, the game varies between the mid-30s and high 50s, depending on the complexity of the scene. Turning up the RT quality sees frames drop incrementally into the 30s and finally high 20s. This time though, bringing in DLSS greatly helps to restore these lost frames. I found that DLSS quality was all that was required to make Ultra RT perform like normal RT, and DLSS balanced almost brings the frame rate up to 60. Your preference may vary from mine, but I think DLSS starts to look a bit weird below balanced, so I'd probably be inclined to drop RT quality before going any further. As well as being Epic's primary cash cow, Fortnite is also their showcase for the Unreal Engine. 
As such, it shouldn't be too surprising that the game features the gamut of RT effects. Not, of course, that anyone really uses them. Fortnite players want more FPS, to the extent that many people with perfectly good PCs run it in performance mode. Still, out of curiosity, I gave it a try. At 1080 high settings without RT, the game runs at between 80 and 90 FPS. Turning RT on high sees that drop like a stone that forgot its parachute, managing to reach only the low 20s and more often in the high teens. It's not impossible to play at these settings, but be honest, if I told you RTX wasn't on and the GPU was just shit, would you know the difference? I find most battle royales benefit from resolution and detail, especially when sniping, so I'd be inclined to skip RT altogether in this one if it means sacrificing resolution. If you're determined to give it a go, enabling DLSS balance doesn't look too terrible, and FPS are effectively doubled. Still a little subpar, but better than the weird mush that is DLSS performance. While the original Crisis was renowned as a PC melter, Crisis 2 was much more conventional in its system requirements. With the 2021 remaster, it seems that Crytek wasn't done with aiming for future spec PCs. While its software-based global illumination and RT reflections engine work with any powerful enough GPU, it can also use hardware acceleration. Given how big of an impact RT has on frames with RTX, I shudder to think how non-RTX hardware would perform. Maximum quality RT once more cuts frames in half, and DLSS doesn't quite restore the lost performance until dropping it to balanced. Adjusting the RT settings down a bit would help somewhat, and honestly, that's kind of the underlying message of the video. Getting into RTX at the lowest price point is going to involve a lot of tweaking, a lot of compromise, and ultimately a lot of disappointment. Given how resource-intensive RT can be, it's no surprise that the early titles to use the full feature set would be otherwise extremely basic. Minecraft famously runs on a potato, but RTX maps can be mind-bendingly demanding. Now, I haven't played Minecraft in over a decade at this point, so forgive me if my analysis is a bit shallow here. In enclosed spaces like this demo scene from Nvidia, it's possible to see one of the fundamental flaws of running RT on a low power system. The noise reduction being applied to the lighting effects shows up as some weird blobby artifacts which stabilize when you hold still but are distracting in motion. Moving outdoors and comparing RTX off versus on, another flaw becomes abundantly clear. An RTX 2060 Max-Q is enough to render vast view distances in normal rendering, but turning on RT results in a fog descending beyond 8 chunks from the player. With RT effects turned off, the version of the game I'm using here seems to lock at 60fps. Turning RT on quite literally cuts that in half to 30. With upscaling, which I'm guessing is DLSS, the game sticks close to 30 even in more complex scenes. Turning up scaling off can maintain close to 30 indoors, but stepping outside can see that number drop down into the teens. Things have moved on since the days of the 2060. While the 3060 apparently isn't much better than the 2060 Super it replaces, the 3060 Ti and 3070 are more than powerful enough that RT doesn't require such massive concessions to make it palatable to the average gamer. The problem is, Nvidia is still pushing forwards with the lower end models. The RTX 3050 and 3050 Ti already exist in the laptop space and are apparently a downgrade from even the Max-Q version of the 2060. In the next few weeks, the 3050 will be available in desktop form and I don't doubt it will be a huge sales success. Now, in the context of the scalper pandemic, a card with GTX 1660 super levels of performance and DLSS compatibility should be a pretty compelling buy and will likely still be a viable card for years to come, especially if hardware RT compatibility becomes a requirement. 
The first wave of hardware RT games compromised by only utilising part of the RT feature set, be that reflections or shadows. Now, we're starting to see more games using 100% hardware ray-traced global illumination, shadows, reflections, and even sound, and these titles will no doubt become even more common. One of the biggest benefits of RT is in game development. Dynamic ray-traced lighting means the scene can be realistically illuminated with only appropriate light sources instead of relying on dozens of additional hidden lights to simulate the effect of global illumination. This will inevitably cut down on development time, which has been a huge sticking point across the industry in the last few years, so it makes sense that the industry would be enthusiastic about making hardware RT the norm. With consoles embracing RT, it seems like only a matter of time before it stops becoming optional in AAA games. While that will be pretty devastating for the used graphics card market in general, those who have even a lowly entry-level RTX GPU, like a 2060, 3050 or even a laptop, can take some comfort in this. Consoles like the PS5 and Xbox Series X might well have RT functionality, but as it stands, their actual performance isn't much different from some of the lower-end first-gen RTX GPUs, and thanks to the ever-advancing field of upscaling tech, we can expect them to be producing at least 30 FPS ray-traced experiences at quote-unquote 4K for at least the next half decade. In conclusion then, is an entry-level RTX card worth buying in 2022? I think so. I'm a believer in the future of ray tracing, and I think more importantly the games industry believes in it. Sooner or later, something you want to play will probably require hardware RT. What's really going to swing it for owners of low-end RT GPUs is their own tolerance for upscaling and low frame rates. Whereas today's testing has shown that balanced DLSS can bring mostly tolerable FPS with mostly tolerable quality, more demanding games in the future won't be so kind to low-end hardware. Thanks for watching, kindly do the usual YouTube things if you feel so inclined, and I'll see you next time.